34 passengers on board Greyhound Bus 1170 were sleeping or sitting peacefully on an otherwise uneventful bus ride that fateful evening of July 30, 2008, as it rumbled along a route from Alberta to Winnipeg, Canada. The long 15-hour bus ride should have been a benign and uninteresting ride intermixed with some sleep, cigarette breaks, and a few stops along some desolate country towns in between the two cities. Undenounced to the passengers of Bus 1170, a man by the name of Vince Lee would board the bus along its route. The unassuming Asian man wearing sunglasses did not stick out at all. However, the peace and tranquility of the night would soon be broken when Lee unexplainably pulled out a knife and stabbed the man next to him to death. The details of the grisly crime and the subsequent fallout from Lee's trial would forever change the Canadian public's discourse over the treatment of mental illness in the country's justice system. Caught in between the warring sides of those wanting maximum punishment versus recognizing the humanity of the mentally ill were both the family of Lee's victim, Tim McLean, and Vincent Lee himself. When Tim McLean boarded bus 1170 in Alberta around midnight on July 30, 2008, he was headed home to Winnipeg after working the carnival in Alberta. 23-year-old Tim McLean was described by his friends and family as a free spirit. He never liked to stay in one place for too long, and he always wanted to move around, experience new places, and work new jobs. Working at the carnival in Alberta was perfect for him since he got to interact with many different people during his job as a carnival barker. Carnival barkers are the people that entice carnival goers into playing the game they're operating. The job gave Tim the freedom he liked to express himself and have fun while meeting new people. But the days were long and Tim was tired. Once the carnival had finished, he decided to head back home for some much needed rest. After getting on board the bus, passengers noted that by the evening of July 30th, Tim was fast asleep. Sitting near the back of the bus, about one row ahead of the toilet, Tim had his headphones on and had his head leaning up against the window as he slept. Undenounced to him, at about 6.55 that evening, the bus made a regularly scheduled stop in the small town of Erickson, Manitoba. Here, the bus picked up a new passenger, Vincent Lee. When Lee first got on the bus, he sat near the front. Beyond sporting a pair of sunglasses at night, the 44-year-old Lee was otherwise unassuming. After taking his seat near the front, he sat quietly for about an hour until the bus pulled over to the side of the road for a scheduled smoke break. A lot of the passengers stepped off to smoke, including Lee. According to a passenger who spoke with Lee during this break, he was calm and polite. He spoke with Lee, and Lee also struck up some small talk with a female passenger. The passenger did not remember what they spoke about, but said it was unassuming and definitely not odd or weird. Once the passengers had finished smoking their cigarettes, the bus driver shepherded them back on to continue their journey towards Winnipeg. But once Lee was back on the bus, instead of sitting in the same seat towards the front, he chose to sit all the way in the back next to Tim McLean. At this time, it's disputed whether Tim was asleep or not. Some people claim that he did wake up and greet Lee. Others said that he stayed asleep the whole time. Regardless of whether he woke up or not, every passenger unequivocally agreed that there had been no dispute between Lee and McLean, or anyone else for that matter. All the passengers were calm and just trying to get home after a long bus ride. But that calm would be shattered about 30 minutes after stopping for that smoke break at 8.30 p.m. that night. At 8.30, without any warning whatsoever, Lee stood up and pulled out a large hunting-type knife. Without saying a single word, he started stabbing McLean repeatedly in the neck as he slept. The passenger that sat right in front of Lee saw the whole attack unfold. According to him, Lee did not say or do anything prior to standing up and pulling out the knife. Even during the attack, his face remained stoic and he did not make a sound, not even as much as a grunt as he plunged his knife into McLean's neck about eight or nine times. 
As soon as the attack started, this man ran forward to get the bus driver's attention. Even though Tim was now screaming in agony, most of the passengers were asleep and not paying attention to what was unfolding around them. The bus driver quickly obliged and pulled the bus over to the side of the road. Once pulled over, the same man turned to see if he could assist Tim in any way. Why he would do this is because this passenger was a veteran and had served in the Canadian Army. He felt he had the training and experience necessary to take Lee down. However, after advancing towards Lee, Tim stopped screaming. Quickly realizing that he was dead and could not be saved, the passenger fled with the rest of the bus's occupants onto the side of the highway. While all of this was unfolding, a long-haul trucker saw the bus pull over and all of its passengers spill out. Quickly realizing that something was not right, he pulled over and went to see if he could offer any assistance. Upon meeting the unnamed army veteran, the two, now joined by a third man, decided to try to subdue Lee before police could arrive. Arming themselves with a crowbar and two knives, the trio returned to the bus. Once back on the bus, they saw Lee had started to cut Tim's head off and had already sliced his abdomen open. When Lee saw them, he immediately charged towards the men. The three soon realized that Lee was not going to stop anytime soon and decided then and there that the best plan was to lock him inside the bus. After retreating outside, the men held the door shut while the bus driver attempted to lock it. While they were doing this, Lee stuck his arm through the doors and slashed at them with the knife. Though powerful, the men were stronger and were able to get the door shut and locked. Lee then tried to get into the driver's seat and drive away in the bus. However, the bus driver was able to kill the ignition on the bus remotely, so Lee could not do so. After being locked into the bus, Lee then went back to Tim's body. He continued stabbing and slicing at it until he had severed his head. Then, in full view of all the passengers, he walked towards the door with Tim's head in one hand and his bloody knife in the other. Without saying a word and with a completely expressionless face, he dropped his head onto the floor and continued mutilating his body. Upon seeing him drop the head, some passengers became instantly ill while others looked away in horror. Soon afterward, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrived on the scene and formed a perimeter around the bus. They took the passengers away to a safe area while armed officers negotiated with Lee. The negotiations with Lee went nowhere for the next four and a half hours. Lee continued to mutilate Tim's body and professed to the RCMP that he would stay on the bus forever. But for Lee, forever must have meant just a few hours because at around 1.30 in the morning, he broke a window and climbed out of it. Once on the ground, police tackled him and tased him several times before subduing him and bringing him into custody. Upon his arrest, Lee was covered head to toe in the victim's blood. He also told the police that he was sorry and asked them to kill him. Even though Lee was a horrific enough sight on his own, it was what police found and did not find later on that proved the most haunting aspect of this case. Beyond severing Tim's head, his body had over 100 different stab and cut wounds. He was disemboweled, and pieces of flesh were found stuffed inside plastic bags throughout the bus. Inside Lee's pockets, police found Tim's tongue, nose, and an ear. After recovering all his body parts, Police realized that Tim's eyes and a chunk of his heart were unaccounted for, and police presumed that Lee had eaten them. Soon after the details of the grisly attack became public, Lee became an international media sensation. The main question on everyone's mind was not whether he did it or not, but why. To answer that question, police and prosecutors would have to analyze every aspect of the life of a very sick, but otherwise quite average and decent man. Vincent Lee was born in China in 1964. After obtaining a computer science degree from Wuhan Industrial University in 1992, he worked as a software developer in Beijing from 1994 to 1998. In 2001, 
he legally immigrated to Canada and became a full Canadian citizen in 2005. During this time, he married a woman only known in public records as Anna. It's unclear whether they met in China or Canada and what her nationality was. The only thing for certain is that by the time of the attack, the two were divorced but still living together amicably. At first glance, the attack appeared to have all the hallmarks of someone who was severely mentally ill. Because of this, police specifically looked into his background to prove if Lee had a mental illness or any type of criminal background. While Lee had an absolutely spotless criminal record, there was some evidence of mental illness. In 2003, Lee was picked up walking on the side of the highway in Ontario. When responding officers asked him what he was doing, he said that he was going there to look for work. It's unknown what made the police suspicious of his behavior, but they had him involuntarily committed to a mental health facility in Ontario for evaluation. After an unknown but probably short period of time, Lee left the hospital against a doctor's recommendation to stay. Upon his return home, Anna asked that he seek treatment but Lee refused. Beyond this one incident, there are no other documented cases of interactions with the police or being treated for mental illness. According to his bosses at Walmart and a restaurant where he had worked, Lee had always been a good worker and dependable, though he had kept to himself. His ex-wife was able to see more of his challenges with mental illness at home. She reported that he often had trouble sleeping and eating. She said that he sometimes would take long bus rides without notice and wander to who knows where. Lee apparently even once broke down crying to her, stating that he had seen God. While certainly a cause for concern, when Lee pushed back against getting treatment for his mental health, she relented. Lee's mental health must have continued to decline since that July. He was let go from his job at Walmart. While some sources cited that he had a disagreement with an employee, people may never know the real reason. But what is known is that during interviews with psychiatrists, Lee stated that during this time, he began to hear voices in his head. Eventually, these voices told him that he needed to leave Edmonton, where he lived with his ex-wife, and move to Winnipeg in search of work and a new life. Before he left, he wrote a note to her stating that he was done and he was starting a new life. At noon on July 28th, he boarded a bus in Edmonton and rode it until the following evening on July 29th, when he got off at a rural town named Erickson in Manitoba province. After getting off at the bus stop, he spent the next day sitting on a bench. When not sitting down, Lee burned some of his clothes, threw some in the trash, and tried to sell others. The following morning, he put his laptop on the sidewalk next to the bench with a for-sale sign of $600 or best offer. A local resident walked past the man several times and decided to inquire about buying the computer. According to him, he haggled with Lee over the price. The two eventually agreed on a price of $60, and the man went to the bank to withdraw the money. After buying the laptop, the boy took it home and soon realized he did not have the password. Going back to Lee for it, Lee readily gave him the password. After taking it back home, the teenager's mother looked through the computer with him to ensure that there was not any pornography on it. Instead, the pair found just a few job resumes, emails written in Chinese, and a bunch of nature shots that looked like they were of British Columbia. While seemingly innocuous, the interaction between Lee and the boy is important because it's further evidence of Lee's state of mind. Lee was friendly and not aggressive at all, and neither was he rambling or unaware of what was going on around him. Instead, he just made simple, pleasant conversation with the boy. His actions also helped support the manic episode Lee was suffering at the time. Even though he said he wanted to start a new life in Winnipeg, why Lee would be getting rid of all his possessions directly contradicts this intent and proved he was not in the right state of mind. Later, when the teenager was back in the same area, he saw a Greyhound bus departing and the man was gone. 
Little did he know that he had just witnessed the beginning event of what was to come not even two hours later. Once in police custody, Lee was charged with second-degree murder. The government did this because the police knew from the beginning that his mental state was in question. In order for first-degree murder to be charged, prosecutors would have to prove intent was there from the beginning. But with second-degree murder, that burden of proving premeditation was not there since someone who was mentally ill could not have that capacity. Before prosecutors knew that the case would center solely on Lee's mental competency, both the state and defense opted to have psychiatrists examine Lee. During his interview with them, Lee stated that voices in his head told him that Tim McLean was an evil demon that was going to kill him and other people, and the only way to save his life was to kill the demon. When explaining why he mutilated the body to the degree that he did, Lee said that the voices told him McLean's body would be able to reanimate and that he had to dismember it to stop that from happening. In a rare turn of events during his competency trial, both psychiatrists diagnosed Lee as suffering from a severe case of schizophrenia, that he was also suffering from delusions, and that the manic episode he was going through at the time of the attack was still going on. Due to the overwhelming evidence of his mental illness, the judge ruled that Lee was not criminally responsible and would be admitted to a mental institution. While Lee's being found not criminally responsible, known as NCR in Canadian courts, should be no surprise to anyone. What caused all the outrage was the public at large becoming aware of how the Canadian criminal justice system looks and treats a finding of NCR. In Canada, a successful finding of NCR means that a person did, in fact, commit the crime. But due to such severe mental illness, they cannot be held responsible for their actions. This is because most crimes include two parts. First, the accused must commit the actual act itself. Second, the accused must have the intent to commit the act. Because severely mentally ill people cannot form the proper intent, they should not be held criminally liable for their actions. Instead, under Canadian law, those found not criminally responsible are sentenced to an indefinite term in a Canadian mental institution. Under the law, those admitted patients are forced to undergo strictly regimented and regulated psychiatric treatment. Those who respond well to treatment and follow their doctor's orders are given good evaluations that could help them get released. Those who do not do well or refuse treatment will continue being treated for up to the rest of their lives. For patients like Lee, their only hope of release would be at a board made up of a psychiatrist, a lawyer, and another member who is neither a lawyer nor a psychiatrist. The board reviews all aspects of a patient's record and makes recommendations as to different privileges they can be granted, like supervised walks around the facility all the way up to full release. Upon hearing the judge's finding that Lee was not criminally responsible, McLean's family was outraged. His family and their supporters argued that despite how severely mentally ill Lee was, a crime was a crime and he should be locked up for life regardless. People on the other side of the argument stated that those who were severely disabled should get the proper treatment they needed to reintegrate back into society. Their point of view has been that Canada, like most other countries, has treated those with mental illness as pariahs and as people who should be locked away and forgotten. Canadian legislation that found citizens not criminally responsible was a step in the right direction toward helping those who truly needed it. Detractors of that argument stated that the law did not do enough to give justice to a victim or their families. Because of this, the battleground over mentally ill prisoners in Canada flared up with McLean family supporters, led by Tim's mother, campaigning in the Canadian Parliament to change the law. They wanted to have those found not criminally responsible locked away for life, regardless of their danger to society or how well they responded to treatment. Regardless of which side of the argument you fell on, one thing was for sure. Vincent Lee was caught in the middle. 
And even though Lee had avoided a prison term, his quality of life was nothing to be envious about. After his admission to the Selkirk Mental Health Center in Manitoba, Lee underwent strict round-the-clock care and was locked down in his room 24 hours a day. According to court testimony from a fellow patient there, being in prison was a better existence. In prison, inmates are allowed to leave their cells, interact with other patients, and hold down a job to buy goods at the prison canteen. Prisoners could also work out at the prison gym or play different games like soccer or volleyball. Inmates could also purchase personal television sets that they could have in their cells to watch anything they wanted. But at Selkirk, such luxuries are out of the question. As a mental patient, things as simple as a walk outside for 15 minutes are huge milestones. According to Lee's fellow patient, those at Selkirk have to spend years getting good evaluation reports before being granted even escorted walks around the grounds. Most of the time, patients do not have interaction with one another. There's also little to do in the way of entertainment, with each floor having just one TV set to one specific channel that never changes. Doctors confirm the patient's accounts, stating that, like a child, patients at Selkirk must demonstrate that the staff can trust them before granting them privileges or even the simplest tasks like taking a walk outside. Because of the strict controls, the public became outraged when news media got wind in 2011 that the review board had granted Lee escorted walks on Selkirk grounds. Many Canadians questioned why Lee should ever be let outside a secure facility. They argued that the only safe place for him was to be locked up 24 hours a day. Proponents for treating the mentally ill argued that Lee responded well to treatment. The review board had seen thousands of patients over the years, and even though it usually took 10 to 15 years of treatment to get to where Lee was in just two, the board was obligated to act in the best interests of the patient. However, due to overwhelming backlash over security concerns, the board walked back its decision and delayed giving Lee escorted walks around facility grounds. Starting in May 2012, Lee's treatment ignited more media attention when he was granted supervised day passes to local towns. Even though his day passes had to be in the company of a police officer and a staff member, the fact that Lee was allowed free at all caused outrage. Two years later, local politicians and the media found that the review board had been granting Lee unsupervised day passes ranging from just 30 minutes to a whole day causing the debate surrounding mentally ill offenders to stir yet again. Opponents argued that the state had objectively failed to separate violent versus nonviolent mentally ill offenders. The fact that a supposed maniac was being allowed unsupervised access to Canadian communities in Manitoba was a huge cause of concern for many people. Tim McLean's mother spearheaded efforts to reform the NCR Act again. With support from local parliamentarians, they drafted legislation that would categorize NCR offenders into two groups, with those having committed severe physical violence being differentiated from the rest of the patients. These patients, the legislation proposed, should be locked away for life, while everyone else found not criminally responsible would eventually have the opportunity for release. But despite the media attention and proposed legislation, the review board did not retract its determinations, citing the clear and comprehensive medical evidence that Lee was responding well to treatment. But even though Lee was responding well, the media circus surrounding his case was enough to propel significant changes into Canadian law. Passed in July 2014, the Not Criminally Responsible Reform Act created two separate categories of offenders, Those that caused physical harm to another person were lumped into a new category called high-risk NCR. Those found to be high-risk NCR would not automatically be able to be discharged at a review board's recommendations. Instead, a criminal court judge would have to approve the recommendation of the board. By doing this, McLean supporters got a partial victory 
and that even though they did not prevent those who had been mentally ill from ever being released, they did make it just that much harder to do so. But for Lee, since Canadian Parliament passed the law after his conviction, the government could not apply it retroactively to him. Instead, at the recommendation of the review board, he could be granted a full and unconditional release. However, for the time being, Lee would have to continue doing well in his treatment if he ever wanted that release. Even though he responded well to his medications and therapy, the controversy surrounding Lee's treatment continued into 2015. During this time, the public became aware that he was not only being granted unsupervised day passes, but that he now had a cell phone and was living at a group home near Winnipeg. Lee's medical team responded once more to the outpouring of negative backlash, stating that Lee had not had any hallucinations in over a year and was continuing to make marked improvements in his mental health. His mental health team also noted that due to intense media coverage surrounding his treatment, Lee had been threatened during several of his day passes and that he faced public scrutiny on others. His team argued that though he was out on supervised release, Lee was still vilified in the court of public opinion, making him feel trapped inside imaginary prison walls. Fortunately for Lee, he was able to get a major victory in helping protect himself from threats and harassment out in society. Probably due to the intensely negative media attention, Lee was allowed to legally change his name to Will Lee Baker in 2016. That same year, he was also granted the right to live independently as long as he met certain conditions. These conditions included meeting with counselors, taking his medication, and checking in with medical staff. The news that Lee could now live on his own angered many advocates who wanted to see him locked away for life. Perhaps no one was angrier than McLean's mother. Upon learning that he was living alone, McLean's mother was so outraged, she simply said she was at a loss for words. Others were equally dumbfounded. Some suggested that even if Lee were to continue living on his own, he should be forced to live under type of supervised release for the rest of his life. Detractors argued that even if he had performed well in a hospital environment, Lee living alone with no oversight was too much of a public safety risk. However, the review board did not feel the same way. After nearly a year of supervised independent living, on February 6, 2017, the review board voted unanimously to grant Lee an unconditional discharge. With this discharge in hand, it meant that finally, after almost nine years of treatment, Lee would be fully integrated back into Canadian society. No longer would he have to report his address check in with his mental health team, or even take his medication. While his mental health team reported that they felt encouraged Lee would continue doing the right thing, many still felt otherwise. Despite this, Lee stated that he wanted to spend the next two or three years in Winnipeg. He also wanted to start a new vocational school for an undisclosed career change. Lee also expressed interest in visiting his native China for the first time in years. Whether or not he did any of these things is unknown. Since being granted a full release, Lee has stayed out of the media coverage, and it appears that those hounding him every step of the way over the years have stopped caring. While the death of Tim McLean is certainly tragic and horrific in every sense of the word, people must not forget that sometimes the perpetrator is also a victim. Vincent Lee never hurt anyone before or since the attack, and he was the victim of modern-day society's failure to treat mental health seriously. Though significant strides have been made in Canada and elsewhere since 2008 in recognizing and treating mental health, there's still a long way to go. Perhaps the greatest question that came out of this case was how to hold people with severe mental illness criminally responsible for their actions. Both sides of the argument agree that these people should have intensive treatment, but the length of their confinement still sparks bitter debate to this day. And while both sides have merit to their arguments, the compromise may be in the middle. 
But regardless of the debate, people should never forget that at the core of this case, Tim McLean was a completely innocent victim, and Vincent Lee was a very ill man. Thank you.